Good morning. morning. You can get a little louder than that. Good morning. morning. I just want to make sure you're awake. Uh, I know it's raining, um, but it's so good to be together. I was given about three different bad jokes to start the sermon with about the rain. I will use none of them. Uh, Look how mature I am. Uh, I'm growing up. Uh, No, uh, this morning, though, I got a text uh, this morning from um, Kay Hale, and she said, uh, about her son lives in California. Kay Hale's been visiting with us for a very long time, if you don't know Kay, but she texts me so her son Nathan, who lives in California, is homeless. She hadn't heard from him for like four days or so, and she got a call yesterday that he sounded very scared and fearful and, and crying, and she asked if we'd pray for him, and so this morning I thought uh, if we would just start by praying uh, together as a church, that sounds like a situation we should pray about. So if you would, let's go uh, to God on behalf of Nathan. Uh, God, we thank you so much for the avenue that we have to, to come to you and speak to you. We, th- we thank you so much that we can approach your throne of grace and that you hear us, that you care for us, and that you work uh, through our prayers. God, we pray on behalf of Nathan. We have no idea what's going on. We don't know his situation, um, but God, we know you know, and we pray that you would work to keep him healthy. God, that you would work to... Um, work in his life that he may know you and come to you. We pray for his safety and his strength. God, we pray for Kay. We appreciate her so much, and and we thank you for her, and we pray for her uh, mind and her heart right now as a mother. We pray that you comfort her and give her peace in, in a way that only you can. We thank you so much for your love for us, for being our good shepherd, and we thank you that you hear all our heartbreaks and our hurts and our cries, and God, that you work. We love you. We pray that we're blessed this morning as we open this word together. It's in your son's name we pray together. Amen. Uh, this morning, I want to talk about something near and dear to my heart, fast food. I joked with Parker this week. I said, I've never felt more qualified to speak on a subject. Uh, Sheldon Cheney, who went by the nickname of Red, closed his convenience store and opened this restaurant in 1947. It was called Red's Giant Hamburg. It was located off Route 66 in Springfield, Missouri in 1947. And it's apparently the first ever restaurant to have a drive through window. You didn't have to park your car and go inside. You didn't have to park your car and wait on a car hop. You could pull up to the window, make your order, and right there your food would come out to you. And that really changed the food industry as we know it. In the 1950s, many restaurants started having drive through windows. In the year 1975, both McDonald's and Burger King started having a drive through window. That innovated continued and continued going on to adding speakers in the menu, rotating menus, workers inside and outside like you see at Chick-fil-A. Now we have apps. We have made it convenient and easy and comfortable. In our consumer-driven culture, You now can't go down the street without seeing a fast food place. And that line, that line of thinking or that mindset to win over the consumer and to make things convenient and comfortable and quick have has kind of become a driving force in all businesses and areas of life, haven't it? I mean, we don't have to go into the supermarket anymore and see all the people we graduated high school with. We can now go to curbside delivery. And if curbside delivery is too much because my kids are screaming and it's hot outside, well, I can Amazon Prime it, and it will be at my house probably within 24 hours. We don't have to go inside a bank anymore. We have apps for that. We don't have to even go to the doctor's office anymore. We can FaceTime or or get on a call with that person. Uh, We've made things quick and easy and convenient, and it's awesome. I mean, I I would be lying if I said life isn't uh, more enjoyable in some ways with these innovations, and it's easier, and I participate in them, some of them. Uh, a lot more than others, but all the time. It's, it's awesome. Appreciate that, brother. <laughs> but this consumerist mindset, where convenience and quick and comfortable being king, I think in some ways has polluted the Christian faith, and maybe Christians to a degree. You know, it's possible that you can be a church that aims to please consumers, but not Christ. That you're more interested in winning a customer than really pleasing Jesus. It's possible that you can participate in a faith today in our society 
that requires minimal effort, that it's, I'm a Christian when it's convenient. It's possible that Christians can neglect commitment and just opt for whatever is convenient. And it's in this consumerist culture, Christianity can kind of become more about pleasing our preferences than pleasing Jesus. It can kind of become more of a situation where we try to fit Jesus into our life instead of changing our life to match Jesus's. And when you look out at our culture, do you not see that a little bit in church and Christian culture in our country? And maybe it's like this in other countries too. But it's what I would call today drive-through Christianity. It's where I want a little dose of Jesus. When I need a little sustenance, I can pull up, stop, park, get inside, get my 30 minutes, get my hour, get my one thing, and go off about my normal life. It's drive-through Christianity. And I think some churches... And maybe even some people have kind of turned this faith that was once delivered by Jesus and this church that was designed by Jesus himself that he died for. And they've made it all about the consumer instead of all about Jesus and what he desires. And this morning I want to talk a little bit about that. And it's going to be a little different. We're not actually going to open our Bible for a moment. I just want to discuss... What does drive-through Christianity look like? What is it? And what's the problem with it? And just kind of make some observations about this culture that's in our country. And then afterwards, I want us to look at one passage that was read to us a few moments ago to see how does that really fit the church we read of in Scripture? And what's the antidote for us to make sure we don't fall into this kind of drive-through Christianity ourselves? Uh, Let's make some observations. You know, when we think about drive-through Christianity... One issue with it is that it makes consumers and not Christians. It can make churchgoers but not disciples. It it does a pretty good job of making people who get something out of it, per se, or, or what they want, but maybe not making true, committed, dependent followers of Jesus. You think about Jesus' invitation to follow him, to deny self, to take up your cross and follow it. It was to sacrifice. His sacrifices weren't meant to be one-sided. He called us to give of ourselves as he's given of himself, but yet drive through Christianity in this culture today really makes faith out to be where followers of Jesus don't have to sacrifice very much. Drive through Christianity focuses on what we get, but not what we give in return. You know, one thing it does is a consumerist culture makes the church a place to go to instead of a people to be a part of, doesn't it? I go to church and I get something, but it's not necessarily a people I belong to or something I'm committed to. It's just kind of a one-stop shop if I want it to be. And that model makes people churchgoers, not disciples. See, when our understanding or view of the church as it's a place instead of a people, we start to twist God's design and contort the faith into something else. It makes church business-like, doesn't it? Where it's, what do I do to get more people? What do I do to attract more customers, you may say? And when the church is a place to go to, we do become customers. The Christian faith, it's 24-7, but yet drive-through Christianity relegates our faith to certain times so many times a week or so many times a year, and even that depends upon what you desire your schedule to be. It's like we can pull up and order a number two. Like for lunch, I will likely go through a drive through just to be honest with you. I will get one, whatever I want, whatever I think will, will tide me over or feed me or please me, and you can kind of do that in Christianity today, can't you? I can find exactly what I want, and I can find what I think I need, And I'll just stick to that, however often that is. And besides a couple of dollars here or there, maybe, it doesn't really cost us anything, does it? We can participate in that kind of Christianity. But that's not the Christianity Jesus gave. That's not the kind of faith Jesus died for. He purchased the church with his own blood, it says in the book of Acts. His sacrifices were meant to be shared by his followers. See, consumers go to church. Christians are the church. There's a difference. Consumers are interested in what's offered to them, but Christians offer up themselves to Jesus. And drive through Christianity, that's what it turns Christians into. It turns them into consumers. You know, another observation and issue is that drive through Christianity says the customer is always right. 
It makes the consumer most important. When I was 18 years old, I worked at McAllister's Deli for about a year. I loved it so much, I have never worked in food since. Um, but by the way, it, it's, if you ever uh, want to spruce up your job title, instead of telling people I worked at McAllister's Deli, I told them I was a club artist because I made club sandwiches. But I worked there for about a year with uh, a few friends on my neighborhood block. It was awesome. We all worked together one year. And Connor, my brother, he worked there with me for a year or so. And I remember this story Connor shared one day. We're at work, and this lady comes up to the counter. And she's complaining, and that's not new if you've ever worked in food, complaining about the food. And she had a club sandwich, and she was so mad because there was a toothpick in her sandwich. She was mad because she bit into it. And she was angry, like we did something wrong. Like how could you put a toothpick in this club sandwich? And I don't know if you've ever had a club sandwich, but you put a toothpick in them to keep the sandwich together. And as you notice, this is not a McAllister's Daily photo because... We can't get sued for copyright or anything, but that little flashy piece on top of the toothpick, it's meant to show you, hey, there's a toothpick here. <laughs> I know, shocking stuff, revelations this morning. But she complained to my brother, and there's this issue because, is she right? She's absolutely wrong. Like, it's meant to be there, it should be in there, that's your fault. But what do we always say in the food industry? Customer's always right. Right? Some people said it, the, man who, uh, the founder of the Hilton Hotels, customer is king, right? Uh, the customer is never wrong, except for when they are. You know, in the church, when you say the customer is always right, that's a bad thing. When you say it's all about what the consumer wants, that's a bad thing. One danger of drive through Christian culture is that it causes churches to treat people like customers and consumers and it che- treats seekers like people who are customers and consumers. And maybe they start to say, well, what do they want? What are they looking for? What would get them to attend? Which I want to be sensitive to what do people need or what are they looking for? Sure, but if the customer is always right and it's always about the seeker or the consumer and the goal is to get more of them, what happens when what they want isn't what they need? What happens when what they desire is not what God has designed? Then you change the church to fit them. And we should be all for reaching people. We should be all for adjusting methods to find new ways to reach people with the same gospel message. But when your biggest aim is to get more people, you often find yourself going against God's word to please them. That's not a fruitful church. You may find yourself successful in the world's eyes, but you wouldn't find yourself faithful in God's eyes. Listen, we're not always right. Do we understand that? That what we think we want or what we need isn't always what we need. You know, we're not always right, but he is. Like, we're not always right, but his word is. And our goal should be to be a faithful church, uh, to be a church that is faithful to his words. And that's not what the goal of consumerism teaches. And if it gets into the church, it distorts what this faith is all about. But there's more observations. Uh, Another issue with drive-through Christianity is that it requires little commitment and zero connection. Amen. Fast food is awesome. I don't know your life, but I would, I would bet that I eat more fast food than anybody in here. If you want to bet, come talk to me after. If you want a place to, look, to go to, if you want a uh, recommendation, talk to me after. I can help you out with that. Um, I love not having to cook. I love that. I really do. I love how easy it is. I love how quick it is. You know, I also love all the choices and options. You know, you might have to go home and look in your uh, pantry and your fridge and say, well, what do I have? Like, what can I make with this and become Picasso and make some dish? But I can just say, what do I desire? And I can go find anything to fit that. Chinese, Mexican, a burger, chicken. There's limited or there's unlimited choices. And also, in a way, I'm not antisocial, but sometimes I kind of like having minimal contact and just getting my food. I have to answer a couple questions, but that's kind of it. I'm just quick, easy to myself, and I get to eat. Little commitment and zero connection is fine with food, but that's not good in our faith. And that's not the faith Jesus wants from us. You know, we live in a world of church shopping and church hopping. 
That's kind of our country, isn't it? They sell me on why I should attend. Sell me. What are you going to do to get me to come? What are you going to do to get me to show up to church? How big is your youth group? How good is your preacher? Not that good. How's the singing? (laughs) How's the singing? What's the dessert table like when you have meals? Does the AC work? Just kidding. That was a joke. (laughs) But sell me. And oftentimes how we try to sell people or what people want to be sold isn't maybe what's most important. And so sell me on it. And the moment I'm not pleased or don't get my way, guess what? I have a billion other church options. I can just go somewhere else. And look, there's legitimate reasons to leave churches. I'm not, not trying to say there's never, there's never uh, good reasons to do that. But sometimes it's just the moment I'm not pleased, I'll go somewhere else. And I've met, talked to, or read many people who say they're Christians, but they don't attend church or they don't have a church home. Does that not sound scary to you? That's not the design of Jesus. And maybe what's scary is that they don't, they don't realize the problem with that. You know, maybe they say things like, I, I love Jesus, but not the church. You ever heard someone say something like that? Or they say things like, I have relationship, but not religion. And they say these things, and it's basically what they're saying is, I'm, I'm, I'm committed to Jesus, but not the church. Friends, that's like saying, I'm committed to my head, but not my body. That's not possible. You can't be committed to one without the other. See, and being committed to Jesus requires being committed to his church, to his people. And in drive through Christianity, convenience trumps commitment. But also, connection isn't required either. You know, our individualistic society, you know what I say about that? Like, we're very individualized, privatized, we keep to ourselves, everything's just kind of us, this is my house, my lawn, my job, stay out, stay out of my life, I don't need to share any of this with you. And in our individualistic consumer society, it encourages us to be our own thing, to do our own thing, and it sometimes influences us to live out the Christian faith on our own. But that's not what Jesus calls us to. If you notice in Acts 2, when he called them to himself, he also called them to community. The moment they obeyed the gospel, repent and be baptized, they immediately got committed to the church because that's what Jesus is calling us. If we're a Christian and we're not connected to other Christians, that's a major red flag. Some people walk into church. I don't know all the reasons for this. Maybe, maybe there's something I don't know, but Some people walk into church buildings, and they never interact with other people. They walk in, they sit down, they worship, and they leave. They never really meet anyone, never talk to anyone, never develop a relationship with anybody. It's like they check off the worship box, and they go, Did you know the most specific verse in the Bible about why we gather together is Hebrews 10.25? And it says, Not neglecting the assembly as some but encouraging one another as, all the day, as the day draws near, that the most specific reason given to us for assembling is to encourage each other. Amen. Coming to church or to church services and never talking to anybody or never meeting anyone or not having a relationship with other Christians, is that very encouraging? You know, sometimes we think if I just do these acts, I've done my part. Encouragement's a huge part of what we're supposed to be doing. If we don't, if we're not connected to other people or connecting with other people, we miss out on the purpose for why we're here to some degree. And I would say this, if we're not very connected to the church, it's very likely we're not connected to Christ. A weak connection to other Christians maybe means there's a weak connection to Jesus. And this consumerism rips away at the heart and design of Christianity. And we can follow that model that the world may offer, but it's not the model Jesus created. So what do we do about that? Because this is, first of all, let me ask you this. Am I off base or do you see that in our world today? What do we do about it? Can we read Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47 together? This is our one passage of the day. If everyone would turn there, I'll have it on the screen bit by bit, but if you want to open up your Bible to that, I want us to read, and there's a word within this text 
that I think gives us the answer to what we must do with this culture. Start in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. And we can just stop right there for a moment. You know, what we see, what we see here is the church of Christ wasn't about convenience but commitment. The church Jesus built was about commitment. I, that, first, that first word underlined right there. They were devoted. They're a committed group of people. Uh, and, and many ways they're committed. Uh, notice what they were committed to. They were committed to the word of God. Right? They were devoted to what? The apostles' teaching. Feed me. Uh, they spent day by day in the temple feeding, praying, reading, studying, asking questions, giving answers. They were committed to the word of God. They were committed to the church. Numerous references there to fellowship. All who believed were together day by day. They were together, eating together. They were committed deeply to the church, to the people that they were in a, in a body, in one body with. And they were committed to the word. They were committed to spiritual growth. They were committed to each other because they're committed to Christ. Because that's part of the calling. If we're committed to Christ, we're committed to all of these things. And yet drive-through Christianity kind of laxes on the commitment aspect. Church, we need to be committed. We've got to be all in on this. To sacrifice and to give because of what Jesus has done for us. We need to be committed to the Word of God. Don't let Sunday morning sermon be the only time you open your Bible. Don't let class be the only time you take an active part in feeding yourself. There are so many wonderful ways to feed yourself from podcasts to streaming to classes, books, things of that nature. But here's my challenge. Take an active part in feeding yourself every week. Don't treat your faith like a drive through window where every once in a while I can pull up and I do none of the work. That I really don't have to participate in it. I'll leave it to someone else to make my spiritual food for me. No, take an active part in it. Can I challenge you to do that this week? To like take an active part in feeding yourself spiritually besides Sunday morning or Sunday night or a Wednesday night? Because that's what the church was. Can I challenge you to be committed to the church? You know, Jesus called us to a community and a family. Don't let your relationship with the church be relegated to Sunday assemblies. Can I encourage you to either show up early or stick around after? I know sometimes we just want to, we go through seasons of life where it's like, hey, I'm, I'm going through it and I kind of just want to be left alone. I, I get that. But can I encourage you to show up early and stick around after to meet people and be connected? Can I encourage you to speak up and get to know people? That the people next to you are just important as what we're doing right now? Can I encourage you to spend time outside of these walls together? Yeah, let me ask you this question. How connected are you to other Christians? How connected are you to the people in this room? We have to be. And all of this happens because we're committed to Christ. I, I would challenge you this week not only to feed yourself, but to connect with a Christian outside of these walls this week. Not on Wednesday, not on Sunday, uh, or maybe today in between, but go connect. Get coffee, get lunch, talk. Be connected with each other. That's how they did it. But be committed to the word and to each other, but to Christ. A healthy relationship with God isn't produced quickly or convenient, conveniently, but a healthy relationship with God is worth it. So be all in on it. It's worth the effort. Uh, Parker and I decided a couple weeks ago that we want to go on a tour of Oklahoma, Oklahoma City to find the best cheeseburger. We're doing really impactful ministry work here at the Southwest Church of Christ. Um, the first place we went is a place called Paddy Wagon. It's like 
13, 14 minutes north of here, kind of before MacArthur's, uh, MacArthur Boulevard exit, kind of by Will Rogers, that park. And uh, I'll tell you, it was fantastic. I have the ratings on my phone if you want to know what scores we gave it. But it was really good. I don't know if we're going to top that burger. But when you go up to the sign or to, the, to order, there is a sign on the wall that says, we cook your food fresh. Please wait 15 or 20 minutes. It's, it's worth it. Yeah, isn't, isn't, fresh, isn't a fresh hot meal worth it? Like when you have it, it's so good. If, if you eat out as much as I do, you kind of know sometimes that food just kind of tastes. It's not, you know it's not great for you, but you eat it anyway. Pray for my health. Um, <laughs> but it's worth it to wait the time and to put the effort in. Can I tell you, that's how it is with our relationship with Jesus. It's worth the effort. It's worth the inconvenience. It's worth the commitment. It's worth being all in on it. It always is. And so my question for you this morning is, which one do you want to have? Like, which combo are you going to pick? Do you want the real, authentic Christian faith that calls you to be committed to Jesus, to be committed to his church, that it's not just about what you get, but it's about what you give and sharing in Jesus and it's all in? Or do you want the drive through Christianity? Or you may get what you want, or you may hear what you want, and you can leave and not be committed and not be connected, but I'll tell you, that faith is not the one Jesus offered. And it doesn't really benefit you much. Which one do you want? In our culture, where it seems to be we go more towards convenience and we go more towards quick and easy, I just want to encourage us to be a church that's not that way. To be about Christ. To be about pleasing Him first and not just people. Uh, Let's be that kind of church uh, together. That is my plea that we will be an authentic church to Jesus and His message and His will. Uh, This morning, if you want to be a part of that kind of faith, if you want that kind of faith, the invitation that was offered to this church is offered to you. You can repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, for the gift of the Holy Spirit, that you can be committed to Jesus. It's not just swipe my card and get something from God. It's a, he's purchased me, he does this for me, but now I'm all in on him. It's a commitment. And if you want to make that commitment to receive that salvation and then live for him, We would love to help you. Maybe there's something else going on in your life that we can pray with you about. Uh, But if you have a need this morning, uh, come now uh, while we stand and while we sing.